so privileged to have John Cogan and Danny Hill talk to us about this important subject, changes in income, incomes, okay, incomes. among senior citizen, citizens, 1982 to 2018. So thank you so much for doing this. We expect to learn a lot, but uh, go ahead. Guys. Okay, well, thanks, John, uh, for the uh, invite to talk about the paper, and I look forward to getting your comments. Uh, so uh, the motivation for this paper uh, is essentially a policy motivation. We're a ways away from any policy. Uh, but uh, if you think about it for a moment, 40% uh, of the federal budget is now spent on programs for the elderly. Uh, if we do nothing uh, and, uh, except bail out the uh, Medicare and Social Security trust funds uh, in 10 years, that number will rise to half of uh, all uh, federal spending. Um, so. Uh, when you think about changes in policy, of course, with respect to seniors, uh, any policy changes have to be predicated on a uh, knowledge about seniors, how well seniors are doing and how well uh, they've done uh, over time, how well they've been in the future. So our analysis is really how well they've done over time. We speculate a little bit on, on the future, uh, maybe towards the end, uh, but uh, right now our paper is uh, really a work in progress. Um, uh, we have really uh, two parts of the paper. One part is to document the um, growth in, in incomes and the sources of growth in senior incomes uh, in both absolute terms and relative to uh, what we call non-seniors, so, uh, households headed by persons under age uh, 65. Um, this part of the paper is really just a documentation. Um, we don't really try to analyze the forces that have uh, driven the behavioral changes that underlie some of these trends. And so if you're looking for um, explanations for why these trends are occurring, uh, we're uh, are very light on that, um, to be quite honest, but we welcome any suggestions you have as to where we might, we might want to go for explanations. Um, so uh, the second part of the paper is really a retrospective uh, look at an alternative social security policy. Uh, we asked the question, what would have happened to uh, senior uh, incomes had um, uh, social security adopted a different policy, uh, a different from wage indexing uh, in the late 1970s, which is the policy that's governed the program uh, ever since. A couple of caveats uh, to begin with. Uh, first, our analysis ends in 2018, and so it's pre-COVID, uh, and uh, COVID has had uh, uh, very significant effects on uh, labor supply of uh, seniors, uh, but I think uh, those effects are temporary. We'll present some evidence on that, uh, but uh, it's still a very open question as to how much uh, seniors will return to the labor force uh, after the uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, second is um, uh, we're a little bit light on will the trends that we've identified in the data continue into the future? Uh, we have some uh, evidence on how well people that are nearing the age of, of retirement or nearing uh, age 65 to be more precise are doing and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, but um, that's sort of what we're up to. Uh, Danny and I are gonna divide up this uh, presentation uh, between us. Uh, so Danny, maybe you can talk a little bit about the um, uh, sort of time period covered, mm -hmm. why we covered the time period we are, and uh, a little bit about the data. Yeah, so we're using the uh, survey of consumer finances. This is a triennial survey that's uh, uh, produced by the uh, Federal Reserve. Um, there are other data sources that we could be using. We uh, often, the most commonly one is uh, the current population survey. Uh, that's an every year survey, um, but there's some advantages to using the SCF here. Uh, for one, it goes back a, a good ways, goes back to 1982, actually even farther than that. For our purposes, we start our analysis in 1982 uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first year that wage indexing fully goes into effect for Social Security recipients. Um, and so that has important policy implications for just where seniors would be headed after that point. Uh, on top of that, you also have uh, big regulatory actions going on right around that time with 401ks and IRS. Uh, and so in both cases, this is a, a nice starting point of where Congress kind of thought seniors were as they were enacting all of these policies. 
Um, and then we go all the way up to 2018. We, we skip a, a 1985, the SCF was just resampling the same people in 1985. So we didn't bother with that year. Um, but the SCF has income and asset questions, which is really helpful for us as we uh, try to discern where people's incomes are actually coming from in retirement. Uh, so we get defined benefit contribution levels. Uh, we get uh, a host of investment income uh, statistics that you can't get from the current population survey. Uh, and then also the other advantage is it captures the regular sources of income. And this is where the current population survey just doesn't capture these, uh, these data very well, particularly uh, in the early years. And so things like capital gains uh, and also uh, DC withdrawals, you just don't see it in the uh, in uh, the CPS. And so that's sort of the reason why we're using the SCF. If you read our paper, you'll note that we always sort of compare back to the CPS and pretty much all of the trends we identify using the SCF, it shows up in the CPS too. So the magnitudes vary a little bit, but uh, our conclusions stay the same. So, um... To amplify just on one point that Danny made uh, regarding policy. So uh, IRAs weren't enacted into law until 1974. And the big social security change, the wage indexing, was enacted just three years later in 1977. 401ks were not enacted into law until 1978, so after the big social security change. And they really didn't become effective. The reg, uh, Treasury didn't issue regulations until 1982. And so they, when were, you, they were incorporated back by me to the Reagan tax policy. Mm -hmm. It's tax policy. It's tax policy, of course. And the rules were substantially uh, liberalized, improved, mm -hmm. and easy, et cetera. So they were very cumbersome for that. Yeah. So when you see this tremendous growth in uh, asset levels in DC plans and income uh, attributable to those plans, you can thank Michael for his excellent <laughs> 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 President ran with the <laughs> candidate ran with So I guess the, the basic point, though, with respect to Social Security is during the debates over wage indexing of Social Security, there really isn't any discussion about IRAs. I don't want to say any, but very little discussion in the congressional debates about IRAs and nothing about uh, 401ks. And so you could think about Congress at the time sort of thinking that Social Security was really going to be the driving force behind uh, senior senior incomes. And as we'll see, it is, of course, for lower income seniors, but less important for middle and upper. So let's get to the data. So this first chart, <coughs> 1982 to 2018, uh, the trends in senior and non-senior incomes. And uh, seniors are households headed by persons age 65 and older. Non-seniors are all others. Uh, the, uh, all of the income statistics are, of course, in real terms, and we've used the PCE as the deflator for these, uh, for these incomes. And that's the logic of that? Uh, we have many choices. We'll show you that it doesn't matter. So I'll point you to the left panel and the blue line. Uh, so that's the growth in senior incomes over time. And you can see that uh, median senior income is relatively flat until we get to the mid 1990s, maybe the late 1990s. And then you see uh, the growth uh, uh, fairly uh, strong uh, uh, after that. Looking just above it, uh, the orange is the growth for non-senior uh, median income. Uh, you can see that it's uh, hardly any growth from 1982 uh, to 2018. Of course, 82 was a recession. Um, so you might want to look at uh, 1988 um, uh, as your starting point. Uh, but in either case, the growth is small, uh, if, if any at all. It's highly cyclical as well. Uh, what, what, yeah. Are you going to tell us what the definition of income is? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it includes all sources of money income. Does not include, does not include taxes. So this is a time when DC people were moving into DC. It's, and what, yes. What concept of income do you attribute to DC? So DC income is not account, uh, contributions to defined contribution plans is not deducted from income at this point. It is counted as an income receipt upon retirement of seniors upon withdrawal. What, what, what is it? DC income. Well, you know, you regulate your income. You, there's no. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, right. So, yeah. so yeah, this is an accounting matter. We're counting. So, so, so you don't, you don't attribute income to DC. You could, you would for the withdrawal. Right. 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 It's different than, than it's certainly. Yeah, I hate to see him. Right. So, are you ever going to talk about uh, net of net income or net of taxes or anything? Uh, we'll have one little chart on taxes. But not much. No. It's not going to change this picture, isn't it? It, it will not change the picture appreciably. That means you don't see much in the way. Of it. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the the right panel shows just the relative medians of the two, of course, uh, reflecting the left panel flat until uh, relative income of seniors flat uh, until uh, the two thousands, uh, and then they begin to take off. That's basically the story of a strong growth in senior incomes, both in absolute terms uh, and relative to um, non-seniors. So this is sort of at the, at the endpoints, uh, the growth from 1982 to 2018. Uh, the median among all seniors, uh, again, in real terms, uh, the growth has been <clears throat> almost double, 85%, four times faster than the growth in, uh, among non-senior households. The growth has been across the income distribution. Uh, those at the 25th percentile of their respective uh, income distributions, um, uh, seniors have grown seven times faster uh, than non-seniors. Uh, and then at the high end, uh, uh, twice as fast as, as non-seniors. You get the same picture uh, uh, with the CPS, it's just less, uh, less pronounced mm -hmm. than it is with the, um, uh, the SEF. So the next point, oh, sorry, what is that? I'm sorry. Wait, 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 a technical footnote there. Yes. You can explain it in words. Yeah, so the, <laughs> okay, so the basic, the technical footnote says, with the CPS, if you use the CPS as an alternative. Is this a median or what? Yes, what median. You, median, okay, yes. good, but that's important. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of skewness. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you betcha. Well, I get that without questions. So if you look at the data here, Bob, you get that point, right? The growth, the relative growth, um, especially among the non-senior population, you get to go 43% growth among at the 75th percentile, only 13% growth mm -hmm. at the lowest percentile. So you're absolutely right. Well, yes, the bars are just the, the median. Right? Just so, the median growth. Yeah, at the, percentiles. At the percentiles. What's the distribution story? Beg pardon. The footnote tells the distribution story. No, the, the footnote explains the it uses the does the same analysis for the current population survey just right. to give a comparison right. to what we're doing there. But okay. yeah, well, do you do anything that's by by a quantile? Other than oh, so a good point. So one of the limitations of the of the uh, survey consumer finances is the limited sample size. Yeah. So we we don't we felt like we had enough to do quantile analysis, but we didn't feel like we had enough to do um, anything uh, uh, more disaggregated than that. Right. Yeah. More, sorry, isn't that? Decile so analysis, that decile well, analysis. We well, just decile, didn't feel like, what, what about 25th and 75th? Well, that's what 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 that's Yes, I heard you read the footnote first. <laughs> 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 the footnote only refers to the CPS. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's reading right. Yeah. Um, wait a second. <clears throat> Are seniors defined as 65 plus or by age? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, households headed by persons age 65 and older. So, I'm at, you know, I've talked about them. There's a whole bunch of other ways to look at that. You can look at individuals rather yep. than households, and that makes mm -hmm. a big difference. Yep. Uh, accounting for different spatial differences in the cost of living where they are makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch of things like that, how how you treat housing. So I'm, I'm going to shut up about that, but just saying everybody should be aware that a whole bunch of choices go, in, go into constructing any such data series. And yeah. There are pros and cons of straight from weeks involved. Yeah, yeah. We have looked at uh, uh, just looking at seniors as opposed to households and asking are the trends the same? Uh, and the answer is uh, households that have seniors in them, uh, their incomes are growing uh, relative to non seniors on the same magnitudes. And right. maybe you should explain to people what, if anything, you're doing about the imputed value of Medicare or something. Nothing. Right. It's all cash income. Yeah. So, 
on the imputed value of Medicare. Um, other benefits? No yeah. fringe benefits. No, mm -hmm. only only cash is measured here. So cash, including including the payout of Social Security, for example. Yes, correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, transfers as well. But some seniors receive from other transfer programs. Yes. Yeah, and that's included. Yes, yes, yes yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Move on. So, second point about the growth in incomes in absolute and relative terms among seniors, it's it's um, uh, across uh, all demographic groups. I, I, we didn't do race here uh, in this chart, but uh, if you look at uh, household type, uh, age, uh, and education, you see very large growth uh, across all of them uh, in absolute terms and relative to non-seniors. Um, looking down at the education, uh, well, first let me get, go to the top. You'll get marital status. Uh, the married <clears throat> couples account for about half the households, and there's not much change uh, in their uh, fraction of senior households uh, that are married uh, between the two uh, endpoints of our data. Uh, so uh, same thing is true with age. It's just not that much change in the age distribution between these two years. On the other hand, with education, there's a very large change uh, in the uh, in the distribution of education levels. To give you an indication, uh, in 1982, only 11% of seniors, senior households, had a person that had a college education. By uh, 2018, that's 37%. So it's really grown tremendously. If you think about who a senior was in 1982, the senior was born, a person at age 65 was born in 1917. So they went through the depression as a teenager, they went to war, uh, and then they, uh, they came out after the war. A person who's age um, 65 in uh, 2018 uh, was born in 1953. Uh, I mean, so, yeah. You know, norms of education and opportunities for education were much, much greater. So we're really looking, when it comes to education, at two very, very different uh, groups of people with very different levels of human capital. And so education, if you were to break this down and try to estimate how much did the growth in education levels account for the 85% increase in median senior income, it's about half just the growth in the levels of education. So moving on. Uh, so explain the huge difference in the middle at all. Come again, come again in the middle? <coughs> yeah, so what's really surprising is just how strong the growth in incomes were for the oldest seniors. And 146% increase uh, compared to a doubling of the 70 to 74 year olds. Part of that is a lower base that we're starting from. But it turns out that the absolute dollar increase in median income of the 75 and older group is greater than the absolute dollar increase among uh, 65 to 69 year olds. That's remarkable. Isn't that remarkable? It, it, it really runs counter to- What is um, it? It, uh, it, runs, it runs counter, the part of it is asset accumulation, which we can talk about um, soon. You know, they, We'll talk about that in a moment. Right. Mortality is much lower. Mortality, yes, right. Mortality is lower. Right. I'm not sure which way that we goes. Right. We could take a survey of everyone. <laughs> 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 that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it made it to 75. It made it to 75. It made it to 75. Right. So that's right. part of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But, but if you, the, people that, but the people that made it to 75, back in 1982, I would submit, is a, uh, a far richer group, a richer part of that population than the people that make it to age 75 in 1982, that's what I would think. But, so the age that you were, uh, yeah, mortality you were in the other direction. Thank you. You could, you could run a regression that, that yeah. pulled these apart. When, I think we could. That'd be more, more, be more, much more informed. Yeah, they're saying, you know, yeah. Right. I agree. Like I said, it's a work in progress. And I hope we're making progress. <laughs> 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 All 
All right. So uh, the next chart just shows you that these basic results that we have about strong senior household income growth in absolute and relative terms are not really uh, impacted by the choice of a, of a deflator. Um, we have three deflators. The first three deflators there are commonly used deflators either for social security or for measuring inflation. The last one, uh, the R CPIE, is for elderly individuals. And so that's like a CPIU, uh, but it uses elderly consumption uh, to form its baskets. And so it's more heavily weighted with healthcare expenditures. And so it reflects the fact that uh, uh, senior citizens have higher healthcare expenditures and that the cost of healthcare has been rising relative to the overall level of prices. And as you can see, like, you can see even accounting for the growth in, um, in healthcare costs and the higher consumption on the part of seniors and non-seniors, you still get this really strong relative growth and absolute growth in senior incomes. There's one other index, I think I mentioned this to you earlier. The, the BLS publishes a research series. It's called just a CPIR. And what it does is it goes back. The, the CPI is never revised, even when subsequent data come in or change, they change the methods, they never go back. This goes back and says, what would have happened if we used today's methods before? So they change them between the housing a lot. Uh, adopted some of the recommendations of the CPI commission, or they use some at lower level aggregate, geometric lower level aggregation, stuff like that. It's going up maybe a half a percentage point, less now than it did back then. Right. That would make a small difference, but just, just because some people are persnickety and mm -hmm. that's starting to be used a lot, they yeah. might want to yeah, add okay. that in. Yeah. It does illustrate the difference between the CPI and the PCE. Yeah. The yeah. PCE grossly underweights uh, housing. And this housing is more rampant. Right. That explains. I think that factor alone explains the right housing. Oh, explains. A trivial difference between <laughs> right. and, 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 right. Yeah. This, yeah. This, the PC is also a Fisher index. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. The PC is also a Fisher index, so the categories are aggregated geometrically in rank, simple terms. Is that it's a Fisher ideal index. The PC. Yeah. 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 I don't know what we're talking about, but I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> the answer to the question is it goes up a little more slowly because it accounts for some substitution that the PCI mm -hmm. the CPI doesn't. I, I wanted to just make a comment. You, you mentioned education yeah. being 50% of the source. Um, I think you're going to find wealth, you know, it, it, it is driven by education. So you have this positive correlation between education and wealth creation. And, and so I, I read this piece and uh, just looked it up and um, the S&P 500 um, since 1982 to the present, even with the decline is up um, over 32 X. <laughs> and, right. and if you just do a simple uh, dividend reinvestment adjusted for inflation, it's up 72 X. So that is the primary source of your wealth creation and the <clears throat> distribution among among classes. So even but even somebody without that college degree back then, um, if they could have just put their money in an index and forgotten about it and somehow lived a long time, right? Uh, that 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 becomes the dominant factor. That's very true. And you know, to your point about education, <clears throat> education goes through all of the underlying sources of income growth. It affects pr propensity to work. It affects your uh, ability, willingness to invest uh, in retirement accounts, right? Invest in, uh, in uh, non-retirement plan assets. So, uh, in likelihood of being alive. Pardon me? And likelihood of being alive. That's right. <laughs> and Social Security benefits. Right. So it drives all of these income sources. Right. It's a very important uh, driver. And it's not clear how much more of a driver they're going to be in the future, which is one of the things that we're thinking about down the road. See these tremendous growth rates, but then remember how much yeah. education levels uh, improved from 82 to the present. It's so unlike the stock market of you know, 72X. Oh, Michael, you pessimist. Come on, Come on Mike. <laughs> <laughs>
this time is different. <laughs> well, you know, the Dow is 882. Right. Yeah. Flat in nominal terms for a decade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Storing inflation. Yes. So, just FYI. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this this chart is another look at uh, how uh, how the distribution of income has changed for seniors. Or let me put it differently, where seniors are in the income distribution, and so it shows the share of senior households by uh, quartiles of the non-senior household distribution. And so focus on the middle uh, the middle line first. That's the orange one. So what that shows is that in 1982, somewhere around 35% of seniors were in the middle of the non-senior income distribution between the 25th and the 75th percentile, okay? So think of that non-senior income distribution, the middle of it as being, we'll call it the middle class. And you can see no growth in the percentage of seniors that were in the middle class until their income started rising, as we saw in the first chart, in the mid to late uh, 1990s. Uh, but by 2018, the percentage of seniors that are in the middle of the non-senior income distribution is 50%. And so, and of course, as you look at the blue line, what you see is that among uh, something like 55% of seniors were in the lowest quartile of the non-senior distribution, income distribution in 1982. And then starting at around the same time in the mid to late 1990s, you see this decline in the share of seniors that are in the bottom quartile of the non-senior distribution. And now it's down just above 30%. And of course, you see the rise in the share of seniors that are in the richest 25% of the non-senior distribution. So there's been this remarkable convergence of incomes uh, distributions between the seniors and, and the non-seniors uh, over this time. And it's kind of a point that we made earlier when we showed the relative growth in the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile, but this makes it a little bit clearer as to uh, really uh, how recent the growth is. It's the last 20 years is really, what, uh, where most of this uh, this convergence occurs, but it's, it's remarkable. It's the simple, I mean, the interpretation of this for incomes is that in 1982, most seniors were basically poorer in terms of income than non-seniors, and then now most more more seniors are, are richer than non-seniors. Like that, that that's what this is showing, right? Uh, half at that 50 percent plus no. the top 25 percent. Maybe not yeah. half. Maybe not half. Their distributions are converging. They're converging. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's right. I guess they don't. They don't. Um, they don't accumulate. But yeah, I see. All the interesting charts, the most policy relevant. All of them. You think so? Right. Because generational transfers. Okay. Right. We're already roughly as well off as people were taxed. So, right. This notion of we should drive this by the lower tail. Yeah. Right. right. It says a lot about what we should be doing about government policy with respect to transfers to seniors, right? Uh, this next part uh, drives Michael's uh, point and our point uh, home. So it starts with the 2018, the relative median income of seniors to non seniors at 71% pre tax. We then used a, a taxing uh, model to um, estimate what uh, <coughs> would be post-tax. And so seniors typically pay uh, lower tax rates uh, than non-seniors. Uh, a smaller proportion of their income comes from earnings, so they don't pay payroll taxes. The majority of their uh, income is coming from Social Security, from uh, dividends and cap gains, and those are generally taxed uh, less uh, than an ordinary income, which uh, uh, non-seniors heavily rely on. Uh, the next adjustment we made was for household size. Uh, the typical household of seniors is about a person less than among non-seniors, and so we used a census adjustment uh, for um, household size. Uh, and once you make the adjustments for household size and taxes, 
the median income of a senior household is um, equal uh, to the median income of a non-senior household. We did the same calculations with the CPS. And the CPS, which doesn't capture all of senior income, as, Dan, as Danny said, um, uh, once you make these adjustments, I think the, the uh, senior income is about 86% still high uh, relative to non-seniors, uh, but a little bit lower. Um, there are other adjustments that you can make, obviously. Healthcare is, is, is one that you might think of. Um, I think it's the case, Danny, that about 14% of senior incomes are spent on healthcare and about 8% of non-senior incomes are spent on healthcare. And so the adjustment that you might make if you excluded healthcare and asked how much income was left after excluding healthcare expenses, you'd still end up with senior uh, income uh, around you know, over 90% uh, relative to non-seniors. And so healthcare makes a difference, uh, but not that much of a difference, uh, still close to parity. And you can flip the script too, and as, as you noted, Bob, uh, that you know DC contributions, we're not counting anywhere in this, and that's obviously going to lower the, the non-senior incomes too, and so that's a obviously a larger share of their income, pension contributions, all of those, um, so it can go both ways. There's one other thing we discussed earlier, um, which is the Social Security's pay is an inflation-adjusted annuity. And so the question is, should you count that dollar for dollar? People over annuitize, like less annuitize, or I under annuitize. It's hard, generally, a view that's hard to buy, actually, fair, completion adjusted private annuity. Mm -hmm. You can argue whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. that. So, kind of an interesting phenomenon mm -hmm. how you compare different sources of income. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go quickly through uh, what were the major contributors to this growth in senior income. And so uh, for this calculation, we just use mean income, which over the entire period of the data more than doubled. Uh, it was 85% for uh, the median, 112% for the, for the uh, mean. Uh, looking at that top row, uh, you can see uh, you know, earnings, uh, doubled, more than doubled, Social Security, and those are inflation-adjusted Social Security benefits, again, Bob, with the PCE, uh, is a 66% increase in Social Security benefits uh, and a uh, uh, quadrupling of uh, income from retirement plans. Uh, Non-retirement plan investment income increased 67%. And so the drivers are uh, earnings, uh, labor earnings. So I should have clarified that. Labor earnings and income from retirement plans are the two drivers behind this large growth in median or mean senior income. Uh, we, we've broken the data down into the 1982 to 1987 period and then the period since 1997, uh, since 1997. And uh, that's the growth period uh, for seniors. And if you look at the growth in each of the earnings, or the contribution to growth in each of the earnings in that middle bank of numbers. You see labor earnings contributing 25%, social security 23%, retirement in plan income 26%, and investment income uh, 22%. And so the increases are across the board that are driving uh, this most recent uh, last 25 years of uh, 20 years of senior income growth. Um, labor, I'm sorry, yes. yes. The pension income being a retirement, yeah, right. yeah. So DC and DB, so uh, including DB and yeah, right. yeah, together. Right. Um, so this is a, a closer look at what's driving the labor earnings, and it doesn't really do justice to what's going on. But this shows the employment ratio, fraction of uh, seniors that are employed for males and females. Uh, from 82 uh, through uh, the present, and you can see there's a decline. Uh, up until the mid 1990s, and then a steady growth for males since then. Uh, for for females, uh, you see a flat uh, a a flat into the early 1990s, and then you see a growth. If I were to blow this picture out to include um, all the data from the end of World War II to the present, this thing would be unbelievably U-shaped. That is, employment rates for sen uh, for uh, senior males. Uh, declined steadily and substantially from the late 1940s all the way through to the mid-1990s with really no uh, interruption of the trend. 
And all of a sudden, in the mid-1990s, it reverses and starts going up. And that's what you see here is the reversal. Uh, but in, in uh, uh, CPS data, which matches this, but goes back longer in time, it's a tremendous uh, U-shaped uh, uh, pattern. For uh, women, uh, employment rates slightly declined for these older women, slightly declined from uh, the 1970s uh, to the late 1980s. Uh, and then starts uh, an upward rise uh, uh, as well. So, uh, so both of these these uh, uh, employment ratios have really gone very significant historical changes. There's a lot of stories about why the changes occurred, but there's really nothing in the literature that you can point to that really nails the explanation. A lot of good stories. So don't you want to adjust for the age distribution? Of the elderly, so okay. we have. Okay, that's, and it's that's U-shaped. That's yeah, it's good, good question. And it's U-shaped for sixty-five to sixty-nine year olds, seventy to seventy-four year olds, and seventy-five and older. And so it just follows exactly the same, the same pattern. And it's very different than the younger uh, uh, workers, right? When the younger workers, you've seen employment ratios kind of declining steadily uh, over the last uh, sixty years. So it's a really interesting phenomenon, but it doesn't we have a, that Pardon me? You want that old. Yeah, we have it. We have a chart for it. Yeah, this doesn't quite do it justice. But is, does that pattern look the same for the seniors if you restrict attention to, say, high school grads or less? Because yeah. they have less capacity to do jobs that aren't physically demanding. Yeah, good question. Right. So it is the U shaped pattern is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, there for all education groups, zero to eight, some college and college. It's less pronounced. So part of it is, I think what you're getting at is Steve, um, but, uh, but it's, it's there. And you don't really see a big change in the fraction of seniors who are employed in services relative to manufacturing, which kind of cuts against maybe uh, a little bit against the hypothesis that yeah, there's even in services uh, the, the physical requirements of jobs yeah. diminished you know i think a, a typical grocery store worker does a lot less lifting of boxes yeah, and stuff right. now than, than that's than right the beginning of your sample yeah I'm, I'm wondering if if your <clears throat> u shape whether it gets interrupted if, if, you, if we could fast forward to 2022 data because you've <laughs> seen a sharp decline in the in the Labor force participation rate and the employment to population ratios of, 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 of older men, not women, but older men. It's just falling off a cliff. Watch, we've got that. We thought we anticipated your question, and it's really a good one. I mean, so this shows the employment rates for seniors and non-seniors, not sorry, seniors, male and female. Uh, and it starts, I think, in uh, 2015 or is that 2005. 2005. And you could see the big drop that you were talking about. Uh, Nikki, at the as the 2020, that is the lockdown. You know, that's that's this is age 65 and above. Yes, the age. If you did this for age 55 to 65, right, it falls for males and doesn't bounce back. So yeah, right. it, it's really quite startling. Yeah, and yeah. so when you when you get your data and age it. Yeah. We don't know the answer. Right? Right. It's right. quite yeah. startling. Yeah, yeah, unfolding. that's very interesting. So in this chart, the the uh, males recovered about seventy five percent of the reduction. I'm sorry, eighty percent of the reduction, and females about seventy five percent of the reduction uh, due to the to the lockdowns and, and the uh, recession. Uh, the males are back to, to around 2018 in terms of their employment uh, rates, and the females about the same. So, you know, who knows what the future holds? But it gets at your point that there's been this sharp, uh, uh, abrupt change in employment ratios, and we're seeing a comeback, uh, but it's not a comeback to the pre-pandemic level, not the pre-pandemic trend. Right. Much less, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. right, <laughs> right. Yep. You should watch out for those those real downward spikes are people who did not lose their jobs but are just not working. Mm -hmm. And they will recall to their jobs. If they'd be counted as in the labor force, right? Yes, that, yeah, that's right. So there, there would be a difference in 
instead of EPOP. Right. If you look at the yes. it's unemployed. Right. It would be in rather than out. It only makes a difference for the like for six months. Yeah, right. That's right. But, but the big downward spike is kind of important. Yeah. We're, we're totally back to normal now. There's no, no, hardly anybody is, is uh, in that situation of having a job but not being at work. It's right, right, right. right. No bias except for that spike. Right. Now, the employment ratio for prime age workers, 25 to 54, has gotten back to yes. its, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so fundamental change in employment behavior is driving the uh, labor earnings part of this growth. Um, this chart looks at uh, enrollment in defined benefit and defined contribution plans. And there's not much to this. Um, you see the, the growth in any either plan, either type of plan, uh, you see a sharp increase from 82 to 88. Uh, and then slow growth thereafter. You break it down into DB plans versus DC plans. And after 88, there's just no growth in enrollment among seniors in DB plans. And what's interesting to us about the DC plan growth is it's very strong until the last decade. And then it's hard to see in this picture, but then it, it really is flattening out. You don't see that much growth in enrollment among seniors in defined contribution plans. And most of the, the lack of growth, I think, is in IRAs, yep, right? right? And not in a 401k uh, uh, related type of employer sponsored uh, plans. I don't know if there's an explanation for that in, in the uh, in the in the literature for the fall off in the growth of DC plan uh, participation. Measuring DC plan by income received from them. No, no. we have a separate. Uh, uh, what's nice about SCF is a separate question: <coughs> Do you have a plan, and what are the assets in the in the in the plan that you have? Yeah. John, did I hear you correctly? It, 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 inc it excludes. I mean, it includes 401ks, but excludes IRAs. No, it includes. No, it includes IRAs. Yeah. Includes both, right. or both. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, all DC plans, right? Right. But you actually do see a decline. If you just pull out IRAs, you'll see a slight decline in participation in IRAs over the last ten years. Right. And that's a real curious phenomenon. But we did have this big yeah. expansion, as you remember, Mike, in IRAs in the early '80s, where yeah. IRAs became available to anyone, even if they had a retirement plan. plan. Yeah, absolutely. And then in '86, I think uh, the '86 Act eliminated that option. And so that might be part of the explanation for the full off in IRAs. One thing that's puzzling about that is there's a lot of rollovers from 401ks into IRAs yep. because they're much more flexible. Right. That's why we combined them. And so it's kind of interesting you saw IRAs <clears> go, down. Yeah. Yeah. go down in the percentage of the population. Do you, do you look at assets? You look at assets. assets. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. sort of assets go down too. Uh, among IRAs, they stayed flat, where DC rose considerably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Participation means if somebody has has a four hundred one k and spend it all, we don't see them. We, don't, no, we, we see only them. see people with positive assets. So oh, that would be either if they're working and contributing, or if they're not working. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, this looks at uh, income from retirement plans and breaks it down into uh, defined benefit and, and defined contribution uh, income. Uh, large growth, as we saw from the previous um, uh, chart. Uh, but you see the uh, DB plans uh, still are the dominant source of income among the seniors. Uh, DC plans growing, but uh, still uh, way short of the DB plans. In terms of how much each has co contributed to income, they've contributed about 50% each. DB plans, you know, about $10,000, and DC plans about $8,000. So they're both contributing. You're seeing this growth in, in, uh, in income in the DC plans, but enrollment is, is, is flattening out. So, so like, like most of this is 65 plus? All at 65 plus, Bob, yeah. What about the 55 to 65? Yeah, I wish we had looked at it a little bit more before the, before the talk, but we just haven't had a chance. That's our next, uh, next step. Um, the little that we have shows a fall off in enrollment 
among uh, younger um, uh, households. So the uh, at the same point in their life cycle, um, there's a lower participation rate or lower enrollment rate uh, of younger uh, households in DC plans. And it's mostly IRAs, right? Again, it's IRAs, not uh, loan cases. That are going. But to give the income that sort of understates <clears throat> the value, right? Because you have increased employment where people aren't actually withdraw taking income from yeah. their plans mm -hmm. so right. that it's a yeah. smaller proportion of the people. In yeah, the yeah. Right. The way Stanford does it, just to multiply the balance, the impute income is between say 4, 0.04 and 0.05 mm -hmm. times the balance. Mm -hmm. Balance, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea actually, good. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't, know, I don't know if it's large enough, but some things that are going on here is the baby boom generation toward the end. A lot of people in old line industries with DB plans is feeling they're right. moving toward new technology with those more efficient labor forces, steel and right, et cetera. But then also public sector employees who do huge rooms, and teachers and other things like that. Right. The, the, the baby boom, et cetera, and very part of the other, they mostly have DB plans. Some of those converted to DC, but only for new hires. Yeah. Uh, Maybe it's not large enough to affect this. Yeah. It's worth it. Sort of the pattern of participation in DB plans is similar to the pattern for the whole US. That as you see enrollment in DB plans declining over time, they've become less popular over time, more yeah. costly than DC plans. So you see a, a slight decline here, you're dealing with an older group, so you don't capture uh, the, the decline, but it's, it's enrollment is flat. Another factor maybe um, in recent years, and it's really become accentuated, is the dramatic rise in the, in the portion of workers who are self-employed. It's, it's increased dramatically, I mean, skyrocketed. And, you know, so, so they, they, they're, ten, they're 1099s, they don't have W-2s, and they <coughs> don't have defined benefit or defined contribution plans. They can, they can, they they can, can but it's costly. But my but hunch yeah. is that would be, that would be an important area. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. yeah, you almost have to have an attorney to help you set up. Yeah, but so so it, it, it started before the pandemic, and now it's just mm -hmm. skyrocketing. Right. Okay, so this this uh, uh, looks at the growth in uh, incomes by source uh, for those seniors in the lower half of the senior income distribution and those in the upper half of the senior income distribution. So the top row in this table shows the growth in incomes uh, among those that are in the lower half of the income distribution, senior income distribution. Uh, and again, it's <clears throat> earnings and, and retirement that are growing the fastest. Uh, Social Security is increasing fairly rapidly uh, and offset by a large decline in investment uh, income. Uh, in terms of the contributions to growth, uh, Social Security, given its importance for seniors, is uh, obviously the, the most important contributor to growth. Earnings, uh, uh, not so labor earnings, again, not so much. Uh, retirement income becoming uh, very uh, relatively important uh, with a uh, contributing a third to uh, to total income growth and now accounting for about 19 percent of, of income um, among upper income seniors i think the only thing worthwhile pointing out here is how unimportant um uh social security is accounting for only 14 percent of their rapid 93%, uh, or I guess in this case, 118% growth in the mean, mean income. So the takeaway from, from this sort of digression about uh, uh, distributions as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, uh, means and medians for the entire group of seniors is this, you know, since we put in wage index, and I guess we should say since we had 401k plans, uh, and and IRA, IRA's finally matured. Uh, senior incomes have doubled. Uh, 
and Social Security for the typical senior has only contributed 18% to the income growth. Um, incomes have now reached among seniors, incomes have reached near parity to non-seniors, uh, and uh, they're somewhat less dependent on uh, Social Security uh, for uh, their income. So uh, from our standpoint, implication for policy is there's an opportunity here to restrain further uh, the growth in Social Security benefits. Um, they're uh, relatively unimportant for seniors, relatively unimportant for middle-income seniors, uh, very important for low-income seniors, which gets now to the second uh, part of our uh, findings, which is <coughs> if you can do anything with Social Security, uh, it would be to increase uh, the degree of progressivity uh, in, in Social Security uh, benefits. As you saw from the previous charts, the benefit growth among benefit growth among high income seniors is faster than the benefit growth among low income seniors, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's what the data show. So challenging the founding dogma of this, that it was a retirement program and not a benefit program. Now we're going to go to the Exact opposite. We're just yeah. going to get the benefits to where well, we need it. Well, actually, <laughs> the, the exact words of Franklin Roosevelt when he signed the Social Security Act in 1935 was it was designed to give a measure of protection against poverty ridden old age. But, Bob, I don't know if you're collecting, but if you're at the your option, your earnings max, you're getting double the poverty line in your Social Security benefits right now. Doing all the so yeah. stray a lot from that original mission. Yeah. To I think be you sure, have... and I think any, to my own view, any policy reform that actually slows the long run growth, adjusting indexing the price index. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to raise the benefits to the bottom as far as it can. Maybe, maybe, yeah, although they're doing quite well relative yeah, to yeah. the poorest 25% of the non senior income distribution. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm just saying yeah. politically, I know yeah. this is yeah. But yeah. also, there are all these papers by Bruce Meyer documenting yeah. that. More, that Social Security is like 20 times more important than reducing poverty more than all the other kinds of payment programs. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, pro, uh, increasing the progressivity uh, doesn't mean, in Social Security, doesn't mean um, means testing it, right? You can reduce the progressivity of the formula, which is related to your lifetime uh, wages, but it doesn't mean sort of the standard means testing. Yeah. So what are you maximizing here? I mean, you, you have policy prescriptions. What are you maximizing? <laughs> Maybe uh, trying to minimize debt uh, growth would probably be the, the right way to think about it. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, 2035 trust funds insolvent at that point. So Congress is going to have to do something at that point. They might very well just say, let's steal from general fund revenue. Uh, but there is a policy that's going to have to be done. And at that point, it's every dollar paid in has been paid out. Uh, and so then you kind of lose the retirement. This is a retirement plan nexus, Maybe anyways. The trust fund is kind of elusive. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But, but, I would is, say, but, but Rick, I would say elusive, much criticized, rightly, but powerfully important now. It is the only uh, institutional mechanism for restraining Social Security benefits. If you look at Social Security's history, it's only run into uh, solvency problems twice once in the late 1950s, and of course, once in the late in the mid 1970s. And it was only in those two instances that Congress took a serious look at the benefit schedule. In fact, uh, in 1977, when they in introduced this wage indexing, they reduced benefits for seniors, including those that were just right up to the retirement age mm -hmm. by about six to 7%. And so, and they put in a formula that grew more slowly than uh, the previous formula. So to me, although the, although the trust fund is kind of a phony device for Congress, it's a real thing. And it is the only is mechanism. The same thing for Medicare trust fund? Uh, part A, yeah, absolutely. That's actually absolutely. in four years, but yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's easy. Is that really for much restraint? I, I understand that there's a trust fund that's yeah, going yeah. to go insolvent yeah. quickly. They, right. they, so that so it's all so Medicare has uh, Part A has only suffered from um, a threat of insolvency once in its history. And so you know I don't have much data there. And there they raise taxes, mm -hmm. and they cut down on reimbursement rates for um, for providers. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So no, that was in an era of responsible government. <laughs> we know exactly what's going to happen. She's <laughs> Bob. I got every this yeah. every year. Every year they'll do it by going down executive order. You know? This is yeah. terrible. Mike Boskin thinks there's going to be no growth <laughs> in, in equities. And I didn't say no. Bob thinks the year of responsibility has ended. <laughs> um, two comments. The, the, the first is. Um, Use the word means testing. The tax of Social Security makes it a means tested program. So, you know, in, in terms after tax terms, because you have a, you have a, a, a tax system and, and the way it's evolved from when yeah. it was first put in place in 1983. The, the, the other, and so they, they've affected the progressivity and through this implicit means testing. Um, the other comment is back in 1975, 76, 77, when they were debating the whether you index it for wages or the CPI, the whole debate was um, seniors should benefit from the real wage gains and productivity gains of the existing workers. And that was the argument for it. So I'll rephrase the argument. They wanted to ensure that living standards of seniors rose uh, uh, along with the living standards of workers. What have we seen since? Well, the living or way, uh, income of seniors has grown <coughs> four times faster than the uh, incomes of non-seniors. So we kind of overdid it, if you will, or they, they looked at Social Security and they, uh, as, a, as a, a loan and didn't account for, and they couldn't account for the changes in labor market participation and the impact yeah, of foreign all the other good things that were happening. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Or that they did, right? They created the 401ks, they created the IRAs. And so they, uh, I think that's right. But let, can we just show you one, uh, we have this, uh, analysis of what would have happened to senior incomes and to the Social Security uh, finances had we adopted a price index benefit uh, rather than a wage index benefit back in 1977. So again, you know, the point here with wage indexing was to keep their standard of livings up at a certain level. And so we're just going to do the same thing and see what happens when we do price indexing instead. Uh, we actually follow, there's a, a number of the debates in the 1970s had a lot of different approaches to how to price index. Uh, we didn't use any of theirs. Instead, we went to the 2001 uh, Social Security Commission, which pretty much proposed a, a method for switching from wage indexing to price indexing beginning in 2001. Uh, and so we follow that approach, but we go back to 1982, the first year that wage indexing is fully in effect. Uh, and ask what happens to everyone's social security benefits if we switch from one to the that's other. Not, that's not the right reform. Right? Yep, the no. right reform would be to use the SCF to figure out what the benefit rate ought to be and, and stabilize the position. Um, right. One, you're, you're right, Bob. Yeah. What, one of the yeah. I mean, just get, just, just get the right reform. Oh. What, what, yeah. Social so, welfare. So, so uh, everybody's well, yeah. constant. Or, so one of the uh, else well, besides the old people. Well, they got to be in a utility function too. <laughs> it's a universal income. Right, so Bob, <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this uh, this reform, by the way, that the commission proposed, preserves the distribution of Social Security benefits. It doesn't alter it. And certainly, you look at our data, and you see that's not what what we would propose, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just an illustration yeah. of what would have happened to the typical household had we done some form of price indexing and yeah. what would have happened to Social Security? You can, you can think about what we're doing is in 1982, we're not changing anyone's what they actually got. We're only changing the subsequent levels of their benefits for new retirees. And so what we're saying is Congress understood what they were doing with how much they wanted the 1982 income cohort to look like. They just had no idea what the future would look like afterwards. And so what if they chose prices instead of wages? Yeah. yeah. Apart from rewriting history, Whenever you do a calculation like that, it's seen as implicit advocacy. Yeah, and I don't think that we, the people at this table would advocate the treatment of advocate price. Um, this is one relative. Let's look at the results. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we'll we'll go right up to here. Um, and so this is we just uh, the, the same data we showed you earlier on. We now plotted out with wages and the enterprise indexing at the 25th percentile, the median, and the 75th percentile. In 2018, uh, if the first 15 years of this. There's really no difference between wage and price indexing. Wages were actually flat in, in real terms between 82 to, to 93. In fact, in the early years, price indexing actually would have delivered slightly higher benefit increases than wage indexing did. But um, beginning around 2000, that's when the, the policy starts to bite. And by 2018, uh, you have a 10% reduction in, uh, social, in senior incomes at the 25th percentile, 6% at the median, and 5% at the 75th percentile. Uh, but despite those reductions, the growth rates are still far above the non-seniors at the same percentile uh, of their respective distributions. Um, and so you, know, you can see it's uh, the, the drop is 85% down to uh, about 75% uh, for the 25th percentile. And that's gonna still be about three times the rate for non-seniors. Um, so if, if Congress's mission was to make sure that standard, the standard of living of seniors uh, were the same rate as non-seniors. They more than did it. Even they would have done, been able to do that without wage indexing. They could have just done price indexing. Uh, and importantly, obviously, we're we're worried about uh, you know what the long-term financing looks like. And so uh, this is actually what the uh, the Social Security uh, uh, what you would have seen with uh, the uh, the amount of payroll taxes coming in versus benefits going out. Uh, you can see that steep drop off and when we have wage index pricing you know you start running deficits in 2006 we go out to 2035 that's the year the trust funds right now projected to be depleted uh, you can see if they would have done price indexing way back in 82 uh, you're running surpluses for the foreseeable future uh, no insolvency and uh, as a uh, share of the as a share of gdp i think you're taking about one percent off the uh the federal one percent of gdp off the federal budget uh just through this in 2022 so um yeah so that's the that's sort of the big result there um and again you're still achieving the objectives of uh the, the 70s congresses and hey, if you laid out all your facts i want to make a broad uh, overview comment on the presentation and uh, go right ahead okay. yeah. so you know the structure of the presentation is to show us that um we've certain we've achieved parity kind of at the medians of the income distribution for the seniors and the older maybe we've overshot in certain respects and so on that's all interesting but it strikes me there's another aspect of government transfer policy in recent decades that is let's say I'll use the word perverse, which is the disproportionate share of government efforts transferring to citizens to improve their material conditions has been so concentrated, so concentrated on the elderly. I, I think it would be quite illuminating to supplement your analysis with something like the following picture. What's the real dollars of pub, what's the real public sector outlays per person, say, households with children and for the elderly. To what extent have public sector outlays taken people out of some standard of material deprivation, whatever you want to use, right. among children or households with children, among the elderly? My understanding, it may be wrong, but my impression is we've done virtually nothing for households with children relative to what we've done for the elderly. From a political economy perspective, that strikes me as a huge first order question. Right. That's, that's a good period. I'm, well, I, I believe it's true, but but I, I'm, I'm willing to be. The EATC has done helped a lot with households with children, Medicaid, right? But but relative to how much we've given to the elderly, you're saying? Yes. yes. So so what, what, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. argument for why we should pro be providing such a generous expansion of? public sector support for the elderly mm -hmm. relative to children. I have a hard time seeing what that argument is. I'm not making the argument. I'm yeah. wondering. And the poverty rate the among the elderly, which John. Households with children. Mm -hmm. households well, again, I'm, children. I'm willing to be corrected by the facts. My impression is that the public sector outlays per elderly person yeah, have expanded enormously relative mm -hmm. to public sector outlays 
for families with children. Social Security, you really and also, I, another fact is I believe that um, there's, a, there's a much greater share of households with young children that are really in situations of income distress than there is among the elderly. Yeah. Well, but I thought that the rate of poverty, ch child poverty, has tr dropped dramatically. So right. I don't know where that's from, but um, well, especially if, through all if, the extra transfer payments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, the pandemic was different. Yeah, yeah. 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 the poverty rate among the elderly has fallen by over seventy-five percent in this period, mm -hmm. and among families with children has fallen much less. Yeah, yeah, much okay. less. Yeah. So what 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 you what social welfare I, function I, would what would deliver that outcome? Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. Well, wait, just a second. Just a second. So uh, to get a, a, a critical point, it is the case that the elder are getting a huge amount compared to a typical family. So Steve's yeah. right. It's, it's, even though there might have been some increase in recent years through these tax credits and the like uh, for families, it's small potatoes compared to the increases in you know, Social Security and Medicaid. No, no, I, I believe it's small. Mm -hmm. I, my thought so was that it had been more focused on uh, the families with children who are poor, you know, and poor families. And that if you look at that group, um, better, which Maybe that just turns that just says the, the the crazy aspect of policy is that we're giving so much money to well off seniors. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, I agree. It could be the result of. I think that's right. I think the result of that in the political process may be to raise a bunch more taxes to do more, perhaps quite inefficiently because we have a lot of programs. Right. Also, they've done a lot of different levels. There's a lot either either carried out by or financed by state and local. Yeah, government. that's why I said public sector, it's not so just federal. Not, yeah. yeah. So I, I've got one quip I, I did get a chance to make when we talked about uh, the health funds. You know, you can notice uh, it's been revealed preference that West Virginia's lockbox has not become a tourist destination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there are a couple other things. First of all, two questions. But first, the suggestion. What, another way to look at that is rather than looking at annual income, is to look at a longer period of time, assumption, mm -hmm. uh, which may be for many people a smooth sum, but also lifetime income. A lot, a lot of work lately in uh, micro distribution and public finance is focusing on lifetime income. Mm -hmm. yeah. That probably overdoes it, I think. Yeah. Or maybe look at several different ways of looking at it. But, if you have any insights into that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we briefly mentioned the consumer, we do run the consumer expenditure survey just to look at uh, the, the mean differences between SCF and, and CEX. And uh, you see the exact same trend, seniors incomes yeah. or seniors consumption has gone up by the same rate. Especially mm -hmm. when economists still start thinking about yep. it. Mm -hmm. um, and then two questions. One is, what did Simpson Bowles recommend? So Simpson Bowles essentially recommended price indexing long term with a uh, change in the, the distribution to make it more progressive. Yeah, so with changing the event. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So that's, that's kind of the most recent mm -hmm. big public discussion of these changes. I was probably worth mentioning that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Obama, I mean, then he walked away from that. Video, you know, so that gives you some cover. Okay. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I don't know the answer to this. When we, when we started wage indexing, did we retrospectively, is it just prospectively from now on, or we go back and index people who've already had some years in their life earnings to their the wages rather than prices? Do we answer that? It was um, anyone who was newly on to the system mm -hmm. was affected. Okay. So it was birth year 1970. So nobody was grandfathered. Only the existing uh, retirees. Mm -hmm. If uh, you were collecting benefits, you were um, grandfathered in. Well, I don't understand that. So they went back. The wage indexing was calculate your initial benefits. Yeah. And then I was so called. So, the right. Right. so, so the way to think about it is if you were born in 1917 or later, uh, you were uh, under the new formula. Mm -hmm. If you were born earlier, you were under the old formula. And then they had a 10 year transition. Oh, that's what right. 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 I forgot. Mm -hmm. But I've got a good story for you. I can. Good story. So, in a world, Social Security, so many people collecting benefits, you always get these odd cases. Well, I was on the Social Security Commission. We had these hearings around the country, and we went, had a hearing down in Los Angeles. And we had a woman come in who had a twin sister who had died. 
she had in her hand her social security earnings record and she had her sister's earnings record and her sister got more than she did they were twins but her sister was born on December 31st, <laughs> and she was born after midnight, and therefore she came under the old form. Yeah, so it's right. just so amazing. Let me ask you, these are great facts. What would you, what would you guys do? What, what are your reform proposals? Can you say that? Yeah, so not yet. No, we're not, we're not there. You know what I'm saying? Not quite there yet. I mean, clearly, you want, you want to do two things. You want to slow the growth and benefits. There's no question about that. Um, can you do something about existing retirees, people that are on the program? Uh, it'd be nice if you could. We've done it in the past a little bit with COVID delays. Um, uh, so uh, it's it's been done before. Therefore, I think it's it's, it's possible. You can tell John's been out of DC for a long time. Yeah, what's <laughs> yeah. yeah, feasible? Right. And then you want to make it more uh, more progressive. Mm -hmm. right? That's uh, I think the, sort of the message that we have. What the precise way of doing that is, we're not quite there yet. Why, progressive, why for why right. progressive for new, new retirees. Progressive for new retirees. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know the idea of using the income tax was a, was the idea there was to means test the benefit. That's why we did it in the eighties. Um, there's not much room left, right, for the upper income retirees. You're taxing eighty five percent of their social security benefits, so you can get another fifteen percent out, right, uh, uh, as a way, way of going. Medicare premiums are also uh, now means tested and they're deducted from your social security check. Mm -hmm. And so that's another There's way of lot. backdoor means testing social security. Uh, but both of those are relatively modest in terms of their effects. Uh, anytime you're dealing with a program like social security, you really got to count on compounding uh, to get some big effects over a long period of time uh, because there's very little you could do uh, in, in a short period of time. I can't remember when it was. I think it may have been when Greenspan led that commission. They talked about um, changing the benefit structure for people who are over 50. So you, 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 you pass the law <laughs> now, it doesn't affect benefits for 15 years. So they didn't actually, uh, they might've talked about it, but it didn't appear anywhere in their recommendations. But I'll tell you this, the Carter recommendation and enactment of the 77 law was the big, the big uh, standard. So what that law did was to say that only new retirees are, are affected. Those that are on the rolls now are not affected, right? But then for the new retirees, for anybody who was under age, I guess 60, benefits were reduced by eight to 10 percent of the initial benefits, right? The prompt six, from their promise level. 62, I think. 60. No, no <coughs> 60, right? So they gave Projected people five years. People were five years away from normal retirement age, two years away from early retirement age. Mm -hmm. And they reduce the promised benefits to those individuals by something like eight percent. It's they were running that, out of money, though. I mean, it was it was immediate. Right. It was they could do that because they had to. Right. Exactly. So now you know we're kind of in a world where people are talking about, well, you can't touch the benefits of anybody who's fifty five and uh, fifty five and older. But you got to give them more time to prepare for their retirement. Well, the idea of giving them time to prepare for their retirement is a good idea. Mm -hmm. But do they need 10 years? Uh, <laughs> they didn't need it in the 1970s. Yeah. Although, to well, Vicky's well, point, they, they did raise the retirement age with the 83 commissions, but starting in what, 20 yeah, years yeah, after that? 20 they years, 20 years later. Two yeah. tranches of yeah. one sixth of a percentage point every two months. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. Awesome. But in 20, they gave people 20 yeah. years to plan for a longer retirement yeah, age. Yeah, but you know, we've known this is coming for a long, long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Down the road again. I wrote a book in '86 called "Too Many Promises: The Uncertain Future of Social Security." It was too soon after the report. Nobody wanted to believe it. <laughs> if I would have waited 20 years, I might have been thought it was fresh. Yeah. So in any event, um, we've known this for a long time. We haven't been very good. Yeah. Can I make one one yeah. one part? You know, on, on your then. previous slide. Um, no, no, the next, the next one. Okay. Um, so you include OASI and DI, yeah. mm -hmm. and the DI beneficiaries have increased 5 million <laughs> since 2019. 
And so maybe a thought is, and, 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 and you know, once you get put on DI, you're on it for life. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive on e for either you party. Get Medicare. What? You get Medicare. Medicare after and after that's mm -hmm. that's my point. You get Medicare, but but Mike, don't you also after a while get get food stamps and you if you're on if you're on DI? No, only if you no, only if you're your income. income. You have to have low income. Okay. So you can be on DI and get social security get social security disability, but it can be very low. So my my policy oriented suggestion is maybe you want to separate out the OASI and DI and address the policy recommendations of each separately because they're very different. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are very very different. Yeah. Just uh, another we'll see fact. Sure. The first time I ever testified before Congress was a Senate Budget Committee hearing on Social Security, and I was talking about the long run problem. And Ed Muskie was the chair, set me up, and I was on with four people in wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeez. I learned quickly, thankfully. But uh, did, did Ed Muskie cry? <laughs> no, he, no, he wasn't. No, he didn't. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll end with this one here. Um, <laughs> so we, these are these are preliminary here, um, and. Question, of course, if we're talking about future social security reform is will these trends continue in senior incomes? Um, and so we, we can't reach any definitive conclusions. We only have data up to 2018. A lot has happened since then. Uh, but we, we do have asset data for these different groups. And so what this chart is doing uh, is pulling out five separate age cohorts. Uh, we have uh, green lines, really old folks, uh, and the blue line are the youngest cohort in 2018. These are people that are still six years away from retirement uh, in 2018. Uh, and we, up there. what was that? The other so uh, we trace the assets over time here up till age 65. So, so the first green one, the first, first green one here is uh, 77 to 82 year olds, uh, what their assets were in uh, 59 to 64 mean assets. So this is in 2018. Uh, they were doing less well than the cohort right you know, below them, the 71 to 76 year olds. Uh, their assets are higher. Uh, you're going to begin to see the effects of the Great Recession here as you look through the trend uh, as we go back. This is the uh, youngest cohort that we've included in our senior sample here. Uh, and so they actually began retirement with lower assets than the slightly older group. Again, if you just look at the, if you follow back on the, the chart there, you'll be able to see where the Great Recession was and, and see that this kind of explains it. Um, and then younger group here, uh, they're actually doing better than any of the other groups we have. Um, and so that's a good sign that perhaps these trends are gonna be continuing. Again, a lot has happened since 2018. Uh, S&P is still up, I think uh, real terms, you know, really, you know, 60% since 2018, so. A uh, decent chance that's still going up. And then the youngest group here, hard to see. Um, they're sort of tracking with the prior cohorts, uh, but of course we only have data up till age 58 for them. Um, so no you know, real big surprises here. We're seeing this growth uh, and we're seeing that assets are certainly not falling off. This wasn't a one-time blip driven by dot-com or anything like that. We're seeing this continue. What we were worried about was with the fall off in enrollment, among younger people in DC plans, we were worried that we'd see a, a fall off in asset levels mm -hmm. uh, and at those when those are nearing retirement. Here, the, this doesn't include housing. This is excluding home equity, yeah. but includes all other assets. Financial so, assets. Yeah, financial assets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it looks like the asset levels uh, of individuals approaching retirement now are certainly no lower, no, not appreciably lower than the current retirees who are at the same point in their life cycle. Uh, and then we do also look at just incomes. Uh, this is also, this is again, uh, a little bit uh, early, um, but we're going all the way out to uh, 76 at this point, same yeah. color, same cohorts. Uh, and we're seeing every generation at the same age uh, has roughly higher incomes than the, uh, the prior uh, age cohort at the same age. Uh, so again, uh, suggesting that perhaps these trends will continue. Well, that, isn't that key? Yes, the point I was going to raise the intergenerational equity issues. Mm -hmm. If you believe that productivity growth is going to be much 
lower over the next several decades. And, you know, we have the division of the profession between the Bob Gordon's new world and, yeah. uh, and the optimists of uh, over AI. And we throw to me, throw people, we spoke a little slower than in the long run. It makes a very big difference to one's view about the propriety of the energy efficient transfer mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. whether we're getting around a large debt, public debt, mm -hmm. and, and or what we're doing. Thank you guys. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.